Here's all you have to do. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Once I understood that philosophy, it totally changed my life. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. If you work hard on your job, you can make a living, which is fantastic. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune, which is super fantastic. Success is something you attract by becoming an attractive person. Success is not something you pursue. Success is something you attract by the person you become, by becoming an attractive person. Never be satisfied with yourself. Always know that as you invest the effort and time on you, that's the greatest ability that human beings have above animals. See, a dog can't be anything but a dog. Tree can't be anything but a tree. Human being, you've got unlimited potential. You can put effort on you, and by concentrating on you and developing you, you can transform your life wherever you are right now. So you want to work on yourself. My dreams are first every day, then my wife, then my kids. I could take care of my wife and my kids now, would you agree? I abandon this. This is the fuel for who I am. I abandon this dream, and then I end up, I can't take care of them. And then I'm going to tell them what? It's all right that you didn't win. No, it's not all right if you don't win. You need to win. How many of you need to win more? Okay. If you don't control your environment, folks, somebody else is going to control your environment. You guys that run teams and run organizations, if you do not control your environment, someone else will control your environment. You are being controlled in your environment right now. If you don't control your environment, it starts with me. When I was 45 years old, I'm like, I'm going to control my environment. I'm going to take every penny I have, all the energy I have, all the resources I have, and I'm going to improve me. If I got to go broke in the process, because I'm already broke. Look, if you're not fulfilled to your, if you're not reaching your full potential every day, you're broke right now. If you find your passion, you're going to have this tremendous energy. It's sustainable energy. But momentum requires you always do the next thing to keep the momentum going. If you believe in what you're doing, that's fuel. It adds more fuel to your fire. You got to keep going. You got to keep pushing through. You got to keep persevering. Because at the end of the day, when you do, and you do, and you do more, you will be amazed at how the universe conspires to help you get to the place that you, that you wanted to get to. So believe in you, block out the shade, and let your sun shine on through. Because it's on you to be you. And the reason you get yourself in a passionate place is so that you change your life, and the only thing that changes your life is making a decision. So while you're in this passionate state, that's where you make decisions. The only way the commitment and the energy and the momentum continues is if you take immediate, massive what, my friend? Massive action is the cure-all. Massive action is the cure-all. That's how you develop yourself. That's how you begin to appreciate what you get. When you're working on a dream, at some point in time, a transition takes place. And the transition is, is what you are becoming in pursuit of the dream. Because even if you don't get the dream, you become such a strong and powerful person, it will so change your life, you can look at something else and say, well, I think I'll go do this then. Because you have now developed yourself in such confidence and such competence in how to deal in the arena of life that you can move into another area and not miss a beat. Once you begin to discover who you are, then you really realize how you have been given authority and dominion over everything on the face of the earth, including all the dimensions of your life. But you can only do that through the struggle of life. And most people avoid the struggle. Most people go through life avoiding pain. And when you go through life like that, something in you dies. Something in you that you never activate is lying dormant in there, that you never get a chance to call on because you have not challenged yourself. Somebody said, the land of familiarity belongs to the dead. That most people like to feel like they're a king in the area of their comfort zone. They only want to do those things that they know how to do well. 
Osborne said, unless you attempt to do something beyond that which you've already mastered, you will never grow. So if you want to begin to grow, you've got to put something out here that you can't reach easily, that has got to make you stretch, got to make you jump for it, got to make you get back a little bit and dig in so that you can take a leap for it. And maybe you jump up there and you miss it and you skin your knees and you come back again and you bust your lip next time. But you keep on and through that process, you learn how to leap higher. You start challenging yourself to dig deeper and then you discover some things about you that you don't know right now. Some talents that you have in you that you didn't know that you can do. If you want to begin to make your stuff happen for you, I think that it's very important that you start trusting yourself. Listen to yourself. Listen to that still small voice within you. Don't try and make everything logical. There's some things about life that defies logic that you just can't explain how the outcome is going to be. I think that's why Paul said you've got to learn how to walk by faith and not by sight. That once you begin to trust yourself and your ideas and your instincts, life takes on a whole new meaning because now I want you to do that feeling that you are led. Just feel, I am led. Ladies and gentlemen, don't give your power away. You don't need anybody to approve your dream. It was given to you. If they can't see it, it's because it wasn't given to them. It was given to you. Hold it, nourish it, cultivate it, work on it. It's yours. It's your baby. Work on it until it comes into fruition. I gave away my power and I said, I'm not going to do that no more. Here's something else for those who make it today. Do what you know is right. Treat people like you want to be treated. Don't try and take any shortcuts. Don't try and cheat. Pay your dues up front. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, what goes around comes around. You can pay now or you will pay double later. So do the right thing. There might be a tendency sometimes because of the negative part of our consciousness and our own programming for us to want to say, well, I just do it this time. It won't matter. Won't nobody know. Ladies and gentlemen, everything matters. And you know you're somebody. You know. I'd rather lose out on my dream doing the right thing than the cheat trying to make a shortcut to get to my goal. I want to be able to look myself in the mirror. And that's what you want to do. There's no saying, judge a man not by what he does, but by that that he doesn't have to do. And to judge the true quality of a man is what do you do when nobody's looking. See, there's some good out there for you in the universe that has your name on it. And nobody can get your good. It has your name on it. They can't take your stuff. It's your stuff. So when you know that, when you know that whatever you're seeking, it's also seeking you, you don't worry. You don't run scared. You don't think somebody's going to take it from you. You listen to your inner voice and you always take the high road. There will be the tendency, the natural inclination to take the low road. You must resist that. Repeat after me, please. I will always take the high road. I will always take the high road. And do the right thing. And do the right thing. No matter what. Take action. Not hasty if it isn't required. But don't lose much time. Here's the time to act. When the idea is hot and the emotion is strong. That's the time to act. You say, Mr. Ron, I'd like to have a library like yours. See, if you feel strong about that, what you've got to do is get the first book and then get the second book. Before the feeling passes and before the idea gets dim, action pronto. Action immediate. Action as soon as possible. Because if you don't, here's what happens. We call it the law of diminishing intent. We intend to when the idea strikes us. We intend to when the emotion is high. But now if you don't translate that into action fairly soon, now the intent starts to diminish, diminish, diminish. And a month from now it's cold. A year from now, can't be found. So act. Set up a discipline when the emotions are high and the idea is strong and clear and powerful. That's the time to set up the discipline. Somebody talks about good health and you're stirred. Says, right, I need to get a book on nutrition. Get the book before the idea passes and before, before the emotion gets cold. Go for the book. Start the library. Start the process. Fall on the floor. Do some push-ups. Action. Got to take action. Otherwise, the wisdom is wasted. Otherwise, the emotion soon passes. 
unless you put it into a disciplined activity, capture it. Disciplines is called how to capture the emotion and how to capture the wisdom and translate it into equity. Disciplines. Now here's what's important about disciplines. All disciplines affect each other. In fact, here's a good philosophical phrase. Everything affects everything else. Nothing stands alone. Don't be naive in saying, well, this doesn't matter. I'm telling you, everything matters. There are some things that matter more than others, but there isn't anything that doesn't matter. Key to take home. Every letdown affects the rest of your performance. Every letdown affects the rest. This is part of the educational process on personal development. If you don't take the walk around the block, you probably won't do the apple a day. If you don't do the apple a day, you probably won't consist, you know, start building your library. If you don't build your library, you probably won't keep a journal and you won't take pictures and you won't do this, you won't do wise things with your money, won't do wise things with your time, won't do wise things with your possibilities and relationships. And the first thing you know, six years of that accumulated and we say you have messed up. So the whole key to reversing that process now is to start picking up these disciplines. Now here's the positive side. Every new discipline affects the rest of your disciplines. Every new one affects the rest. That's why action is so important. The least action, the smallest action. Take it. Because when you start accomplishing and the value starts to return from that one action, it'll inspire you to do the next one and the next one and the next one. You start walking around the block, it'll inspire you to get an apple. Get an apple, it'll inspire you to get a book. Get a book, it'll inspire you to get a journal. Get a journal, it'll inspire you to grow, develop some skills. All disciplines affect each other. Every lack affects the rest. Every new affects the rest. The key is to diminish the lack and set up the new, and you've started a whole new life process. Also, one more thought on discipline. Here's the greatest value of discipline. Self-worth, self-esteem. People are teaching self-esteem these days, but they don't connect it to discipline. The least lack of discipline, and it starts to erode our psyche. One of the greatest temptations is to just ease up a little bit, right? The, the slightest lack of doing your best starts to erode the psyche. Instead of doing your best, doing just a little less than your best. Sure enough. You say, well, it's just going to affect my sales. No, it's going to affect your consciousness. It's going to affect your philosophy. Now you've begun in the slightest way to affect your own philosophy. Here's the problem with the least neglect. Neglect starts as an infection. And if you don't take care of it, it becomes a disease. And one neglect leads to another. And the worst of all, when neglect starts, it diminishes our self-worth, our self-confidence, our self-value. You say, well, how can I get back my self-respect? I'm telling you, you don't have to go to 29 classes. All you have to do is start the smallest discipline that now corresponds to your own philosophy, like I should, and I could, and I will. No longer will I let neglect stack up on me so that I will have the sorry scenario six years from now giving some excuse instead of celebrating my progress. That's the key to discipline. Okay? Let's get kids involved in the least of disciplines. One more and then one more and then another one and then another one and then some more. And the first thing you know, you're starting to weave the tapestry of a disciplined life into which you can pour more wisdom and more attitude and more strong feeling, more faith and more courage. Now you've got something, a vessel in which to put it. And now the equities start to flow. And the early return, I'm telling you, if you'll start this process, the early return will have you so excited, you'll commit yourself to this strategy for the rest of your life. You'll never go back to the old ways. Join a new crowd. Join a new group. The disciplines to do it. Take action. I recommended the last time I was here, the little book, Richest Man in Babylon, and I said, I've lectured now to over three million people in the last 33 years, and I've recommended this little book to almost all of them, I think. Guess how many have actually gone and got this little book? Answer, very few. My best guess is 10%. Such an easy thing to do. In that last seminar, right, I suggested this little book, number one, is easy to find. Number two, it's easy to buy. The most you can pay for it, six, seven, eight dollars. You can borrow that from your kids. <laughs> and number three, it's easy to read. It's in story form. That's why I use it for teenagers, teaching them how to be rich by 40, 35, if you're extra bright, much sooner if you find a unique opportunity. But if it's easy to find and easy to buy, and if it's easy to read, why wouldn't everybody go get it? We don't know. What do you know? You don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. Here's how profound it is. Some do and 
Some don't. Now here's the numbers. About 10% do. 90% don't or won't. We don't know the mystery of that. And I'm telling you, 10 years from now, those numbers will still be the same. 10% will, 90% won't. The numbers don't change. Only the faces change. You're looking at one of the faces. I used to belong to the 90% who couldn't be bothered even if it was easy.